Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Welcome everyone to another edition of the Smart City Viewpoints Smart City Podcast hosted by ARC Advisory Group. I'm Jim Frazier. Vice President of Smart Cities and Intelligent Infrastructure here at ARC Advisory Group. And today I'm very happy to have as our guest, Anthony Vary, Director of Smart Cities with Integrated Network Concepts. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Jim. Hey. Thanks for having me on. Hey, great. Thank, thanks for being here today. Um, Anthony, our subject today is data and networks. Uh, but before we jump into that, can you tell us a, a little bit of, about yourself and how do you how you came to this part of the smart city ecosystem? Yes, I can. So I came from a background uh, over 12 years in telecommunications and IT infrastructure. And after 12 years of being a regional operations manager for a company and overseeing um our IT department, our sales, our customer service, our HR, accounting and finance. I dealt with a lot of the manufacturers of the equipment that we were selling and we were supporting large businesses around the US for their uh, phone service and DSL. Uh, I dealt with T1s, T3s and OC3s and then things started becoming more digital and going over IP uh, with voice over IP, uh, cable and fiber internet. And that's when I had a move to the digital communication side and wireless communications where I started engineering and designing uh, point to point and point to multipoint communications with wireless radios and antennas that could have either been for networks for internet service providers, uh, they could have been cable companies or telcos, and same with cellular companies, such as the four that we have here in the U.S., the four major ones. And then what happened was a lot of the companies uh, that I would engineer solutions for um, I built a lot of relationships over the years, and we're talking hundreds of relationships. And people don't realize when you build these large wireless networks and IT networks that there's many players that actually are needed to make these networks work. Uh, and these networks are the backbone of everything that we use today from computers, tablets, smartphones, uh, you hear the Internet of Things. And what I found was there were companies and cities looking for experts on this technology. And instead of just coming from one particular vendor, I had the benefit of knowing numerous vendors and how to combine them together to build these unique networks to relay information and data so that we could either monetize it or uh, improve have efficiencies from it, improve safety, uh, improve the environment, and so forth. Wow. Okay. That's, that's, that's fascinating. That's a great, great background. So our, our subject today is data and the underlying networks. So what data, you know, apart from the obvious data that we collect, what can you wrap uh, us around all, you know, comprehensively what data is collected and why you might want to collect all that data? So when we're talking about data, um, if we're looking at cities, there's a lot of data that is collected and stored 
in all the various departments throughout uh, City Hall and other city services. And it's very important to understand the data that you actually have and retain and what is actually in this information that's being stored so you know what kind of security you have to actually overlay to protect it or that you should be overlaying um, and protecting your data. Because cities are so diverse and have been siloed for years, it's always a cumbersome task for cities to truly understand all the data that they handle, where it's being stored, and when it's needed, where to access it from. Uh, so when we're going to get into this topic about data and networks within cities, I'm going to cover a lot of topics and questions that cities should ask themselves. And if they can't find these answers or they don't know them offhand, they could have internal projects so that they can answer these questions. Or if not, there's always the option to bring in uh, third-party vendors to help with this task as well. So, so what? Going back to what data is out there, uh, aside from the obvious, what data points does a city collect? So, a city, cities are all different in what they collect, but a lot of cities have a lot of similar services. So, they have information on their residents. They have information on. Uh, tax revenue coming in from property tax, from city tax, and they have residential information on housing, um, where people live, what they paid for property and uh, buildings. They have information on companies uh, that reside in their city. They have information even on traffic uh, on their roads. Um, they have information on their parks, on refuse, uh, waste management. Um, the list goes on and on. You would not believe, I mean, even just, I had a project just dealing with a city, just with their permitting department. And just within permitting, you would, you would be amazed how much information is just within that department and how much information that they gather. A lot of it is still uh, on handwritten forms. It's not, a lot of cities haven't made the full digital transformation yet. Uh, so there's a lot of information that's still manually uh, tabulated and collected and stored. So that leads into my next question is who sees this data? We, you know, we hear an awful lot about siloed public agency departments. Um, how often is this data shared across different departments or, or uh, how often is it even digital and not on a handwritten piece of paper? So that's a great question. A lot of times, all these different departments within a city universally have always stored things in paper files and have had uh, boxes stored of files from years past. And then people try to archive them and scan them in so that they have digital paper copies, uh, so to speak, of that information. And now cities are trying to get everything in digital form. So they're not using copiers and scanners to scan handwritten um, forms and brochures and stuff like that into um, databases um, and servers. So what happens is, let's take um, permitting. Uh, if someone applies for a permit uh, to do construction on a building within a city, uh, there's various checkpoints that have to be validated or signed off by certain people. So now as that information uh, in the written form, uh, that form would then have to be put on someone's desk and signed off by and maybe the building inspector and then it then has to come back to um, maybe the receptionist and uh, the building permitting department so there's lost time and um, time non-value added time and wait time uh, because sometimes things are thrown on someone's desk and they don't know that there's a tension that needs to be addressed to a particular form. And then when these are signed off, 
if somebody calls in to another department to to validate or to verify if a permit was granted, they might not know because it's not digital and it's not accessible readily uh, by other departments within the city. So that's what we mean about siloed. Um, certain departments have their information and they know where to access it. And when you call in, generally, they will transfer you to that department. And if someone happens to be on lunch or not in that day, you may not get that information because it's not shared across uh, the city hall uh, through all departments or at least to another department that could answer a question. Eventually, you know, we want to get, get to a point where it can be accessible and it can be accessible if it's your information just online through their website without any interaction, right. without even picking up a phone. That's fan fascinating. So, you know, Anthony, what's what's um, a little bit insightful for me here is that there really are two levels here. It's moving from the handwritten paper-based physical file uh, to digitizing your data and then sharing your data in an open format across other silo, uh, across other previously siloed departments within your city. Um, exactly. I know that. I know that. Um, you know, as you know, I speak about smart city topics, and very often it's um, quite popular um, that the lowest hanging fruit and the quickest payback in a smart city application is online bill payment, meaning moving from paper-based bills that you pay through the mail with a check to to an online website, you know, HTML enhanced um, website. Um, every time we've had that conversation, though. It has never, to my knowledge, branched off into how about all those other equivalent pieces of paperwork in a city. You bring up, you know, permitting, but there are there are a, a number of them. You know, tr parking tickets, you know, exactly. traffic tickets. Oh, you know, there's a multitude. Permitting, um, you know, health inspections for restaurants. There's just a plethora of those. So that's that's uh, yeah. that's that's very interesting. Okay, so let's let's move on to. We have now we have a scenario where we have both paper files and digital files, both of which require storage. Who stores it? How do I do that most efficiently in the year 2020? So obviously we know paper storage has always been cumbersome and takes up a lot of space. If there's any water damage or fire to a building, you lose those files and that information forever. Uh, so this is something that, that everybody has known about for years, and people have spent time in years past scanning the information to get a digital file and to store it on a server or on uh, a hard drive or a, a disk, um, so to speak. And now we're traversing into the digital transformation over the past several years where you have servers on premise, you had servers off premise, and now you're hearing about cloud storage, which is servers that could be anywhere in the world uh, where you could store and back up this information. And then there's a variety of ways to do um, not only storing it, but how you back up the information and when it happens. So if you only backed up um, or the information that you have online um, once a week, and let's say it's every Friday, and then you had a network outage, or uh, let's even say a ransomware attack, you lose information from that Friday, from the previous Friday and Thursday uh, that you may never get back because uh, it was not replicated or stored anywhere because you're only doing it once a week. So when we talk about storage, we have to see what information you're looking to store. And then uh, it comes with bite size. So you look at how many bytes of information, and then you look at the cost of storing it on, on premise and storing it off premise um, or having a physical backup copy somewhere close by and looking at cloud storage. Ideally, yeah, it'd be great if everybody could have a multi-tiered cloud storage and some on-premise 
uh, storage um, strategy uh, is what I'm looking for. Uh, but price is always uh, in the conversation. So based on your budget, um, you, you have to look at what makes sense and how secure you can be and how much you could back up near to real time. Um, so there's a variety of ways that we could get into a little further regarding that. Well, well, let's yeah, let's go down that road a little bit. But I, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's two two directions here. One, one is, what do you see as someone active in this domain in terms of how often backups are uh, occur? Are they, you know, uh, and I know there's a range here. You know, do you mm -hmm. see public agencies and cities doing it monthly? or weekly or daily or in some other version of near real time? It's been a, a, exactly how you stated it. It's been a progression from monthly to weekly uh, to a few days uh, to every night. Uh, and now some are doing it three times a day. Um, so when you're, the more frequent you're backing up your data, um, the more you're avoiding the risk of losing this data should a disaster occur um, or an attack or um, a natural disaster. So the reason why people in cities are backing up their data, uh, we call this replication um, and data storage, is because you want to mitigate the cost of downtime. So if your network is down um, and you don't have the capability to do normal daily business practices, how much is that costing your city in lost labor? Um, how much is that costing your city in damaged reputation from residents not being able to get services or not get um, permitting or not being able to get uh, pool passes, um, it, it could be a variety of things. So you want to avoid the, um, downtime as much as you can um, in any business, it's, and especially a city. And ways to do that is to not only back up your data, um, but also to look how your networks and your IT infrastructure is configured um, and to have assessments to verify and validate uh, how your network is performing. Um, okay. So, so Anthony, we you know we we covered um, how how frequently you back up your data, but but you also referred to uh, multi-level backup strategies and a variety of different approaches on-site, off-site, your server, somebody else's server, uh, in the cloud. Yes. Um, what, where is that, what's the philosophy on that today for the most forward thinking and yet, you know, cost conscious uh, public agencies? So a quick, uh, a quick, brief history, everything was on premise and then people heard about the cloud storage and people started pushing their data to the cloud. And it's, it's, if I had a graph to show you, it would be like a bell curve um, where the, the top of the graph and the top of the bell is where people push so much data to the cloud and then they realize how expensive cloud storage is and that it was too cumbersome. Then they started pulling things out of the cloud um, to the point where maybe they have about 70% in the cloud and 30% on premise. Um, and there's ways to identify which data and which applications you want on premise. Those are the ones that you need fast and will have low latency. Any applications and data that are on premise will reduce the latency uh, for you and for anybody accessing those applications and data. So then when you're down to about 70% of your storage in the cloud, now people are realizing hey, I don't want all my cloud storage with one vendor. God forbid if something happens with um, one cloud provider, I'm really um, SOL if I can't get all that data that we need to operate. So now people are realizing and 
for redundancy purposes um, and for ensuring network uptime, they're using multiple cloud vendors and they might use two or even three besides having some on premise. So that's what I'm seeing the, the most um, innovative and uh, leading cities today are are following that trend of using multi multi cloud vendors and some on premise. Hmm, Anthony, that's that's interesting because as you know, I come from uh, the transportation domain, and a few years ago, um, the uh, connected vehicle CVRIA connected vehicle reference implementation architecture group was at the US DOT, and they, they defined I think it was four or five hierarchical levels of of uh, storing your data and each of those levels were defined by their latency time mm -hmm. so you had at the lowest level a few milliseconds between adjacent vehicles or a vehicle and a pedestrian at a crosswalk and then um i don't know exact units but i think it went from milliseconds to minutes to hours to days and then to a month and each each of those data chunks resided in different pieces of the architecture. So mil, so device to device communication was mil, it was in milliseconds. Within your traffic signal, it might be seconds. In a local data aggregator, it might be minutes. And then maybe you know once a day, your traffic management center would upload all that information and back it up back at back at uh, you know the the city offices. So I think what you're suggesting there is it's, it's evolving along a similar paradigm. Yes, it is. And I'm touching sort of high level on this because uh, it, it gets very technical uh, to the point where there's there are companies that their sole business is just to help cities and companies orchestrate the proper configuration of multi-cloud providers so that everything is configured properly so you can share information between departments and between applications. Now, to give a little more detail on that, you hear of as a service, platforms as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and so forth. Right. So when you have software as a service, that means you're not buying um, a CD and putting it in uh, your disk drive in, in your desktop computer, loading software on it, and then using, uh, let's say, uh, some accounting software. Um, so when you get it as a service, it's already in a cloud somewhere. It might be a private cloud, but let's say it's Azure. Now you're using another application, and that's in... Um, Google's cloud. And then you have a third application, software as a service, um, that is using AWS. So now how do you share data that's residing in three different cloud providers, even though you haven't selected them as your multi-tiered cloud storage platform? So this is where companies come in, that that's their forte and that's their specialization. They're able to configure and grab the data from these different software as a service providers and open communication, but still make sure it's secure and allow different departments to access this data that is owned within the city or within a company. That's fascinating. Are there, I'm assuming there are no documented, open, standardized APIs between those platforms, are there? Yeah, not that I know of. Hmm. That's that's fascinating, uh, but we won't go uh, too far much deeper in that. We've only got an hour. <laughs> only got an hour here, Anthony. So, so what's what's readily obvious to everyone um, is cybersecurity. You know, we hear ransomware attacks on cities, and there's some just gruesome stories from Atlanta to to small towns to a rural network in Tex Texas, uh, electrical co-ops. And um, it's only increasing with, uh, you know, now with the coronavirus, we're all working at home with, uh, you know, and we're all potential network access points for, for uh, hackers. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about 
cybersecurity and how secure are all these approaches, whether it's on site, off site, in the cloud, or somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, so um, cybersecurity uh, used to be simpler where you only had to worry about um, devices as such as your servers and your desktops and laptops. and But now you have to worry about smartphones. You have to worry about data stored in, in the cloud, um, data that's coming off of your Internet of Things network, um, edge computing. So there's varieties of layers of security that can be implemented to provide security for these diverse hybrid networks that are everywhere today. So to the answer is there is great security software and implementation and configuration uh, that can protect your networks uh, and it's readily available. The problem is there are so many options out on the market today and if you implemented IoT security, cloud security, um, and then your main IT security, and then you added some robust uh, phishing um, security for email security. Uh, you could be paying so much money that it'll cripple a city or um, a company. So you have to be strategic in understanding what the security that you're looking at is going to provide you and what fits your budget and what can you pick and select here and there that will provide the most security at the most economical price for you. And then how do you validate that? That's a whole nother topic to get into is how often do you validate your security uh, policies and measures that you have? Okay. Uh, be, so. Yeah. So, well, Anthony, then let, let me jump ahead. I've got a, only a handful of, of remaining questions, but let me jump ahead in my list too. Um, so what would be, what's the, what's a good strategy for a comprehensive security assessment? So with a comprehensive security assessment, you only know what you can secure if you know what you're, you actually have. And what we're talking about actually have where is what devices are connected to your network, what data traverses that network, and who has authorization to be on your network. And then once in once you go through and get an inventory list of all the applications, all the employees, um, and third-party vendors that are allowed access. What kind of access? Because um, there's varieties of different authorizations that you'll grant people uh, within your network. So you have to validate those credentials with the uh, authorizations that they're granted as well. So a, a comprehensive security assessment will go over all this information, but most importantly, what it does is we'll look at the configuration of the network equipment, um, the firewalls, the routers, the switches, and connections, uh, any VPN connections for remote users or third-party vendors that will have access to your network. And then we'll be, uh, a security assessment will be able to tell you where there's vulnerabilities, where there's open areas within your network, and we'll be able to tell you um, what equipment's not properly configured. What's a better way or better configuration for some of this equipment that will provide more security um, and prevent attacks from getting into the network? So, so Anthony, before uh, it sounds to me that before I actually perform um, a true comprehensive security assessment, that I really should perform a network assessment to comprehensively determine what hardware and software I actually have. Yes, exactly. Because if you don't have that information, you're not going to get a true security assessment. It's like a horse with blinders on. If you're only looking at part of the network and doing a security assessment based on only what you see or what you're given, um, you're not going to get a full idea and a, the bird's eye view of what's going on. 
Well, Anthony, it's only my intuition, but I would guess in the technology world we live in that there's a plethora of devices and public agencies don't have uh, a terribly good view of all the hardware actually on their network. Um, have you been involved in situations or applications where you can perhaps share an anonymous story of what's really uh, – how – well, does a public agency really know what's on their network? Yeah, I could share several stories. Um, a couple, I'll give you a couple details of two scenarios where uh, a major city was asking for a security assessment. Uh, they procured probably nine to ten million dollars of IT infrastructure. Um, some of them security appliances and being firewalls and some with software, uh, but they had no way to know if they even had it configured properly or if it was even providing them any security. So they sent out an RFP um, to have companies come in uh, to do a security assessment for them. And I attended uh, the first meeting um, that I had with uh, the CIO and the IT manager, and there were five other companies there, and they asked if there were any questions. It was about a 45, 46 page proposal that I read through each entire page. I was the only one who asked any questions. The other guys that were there from the other companies were your general salespeople that didn't have the technical aptitude to even understand some of the information in the proposal. And the CIO and the IT manager couldn't answer some simple questions of how many devices were even in their network, um, what was their IP blog, and if they had SNMP configured on most of their devices. So th those were questions that they had to get back to me on. And some of the other questions I asked them was, did they know all the software um, from all the different departments in the city that were on their network? And they didn't know offhand, and they didn't know who would know that answer either. Um, wow. So what happens is most cities, like a lot of companies I see too, IT departments are putting out fires in a, a reactive environment, um, and they're always playing catch up. And cities and will have different departments that will get software that maybe another department can use or would benefit from having, but they don't communicate in the procurement process that they were even looking for the solution. So I've seen cities have different competitive software options within the same city that perform the same task, um, but they didn't know that that was even going on because the departments don't communicate about that. And they, when they need something, they look for a solution and they're not worried about communicating with other, other departments or even asking the other departments if they had a solution that they're currently using for that. Um, so that's one instance. Another uh, instance is another city that I was working with and looking to do a security assessment, and we did, we, they weren't using any network monitoring solution at all. Um, so when we're talking about network monitoring, this is software that looks at all the devices within a network um, and will report in the network health and performance and tell you if a, a device is out um, or if there's some issue with it. So if you don't have this basic software, um, this network monitoring, you don't see, it's almost like you're blindfolded as an IT professional and you're just answering phone calls if there are issues being reported because you have nothing that you could look into the network to see how it's performing. And here you're talking about an SNMP network management tool, Yes. Correct? Uh, again, I come from the transportation world, and uh, you know the all of the USDOT um, standards all require SNMP. 
and an unambiguous MIB data table. Mm -hmm. So you know exactly what object <laughs> what object is where in your traffic signal, in your ramp meter, in your um, street light, you know, even mm -hmm. in your street light. Yeah. That's fascinating. Which is, it's important. And that shows you even in transportation knows how valuable it is to be able to monitor these devices and they don't have to be read, write access. The monitoring solutions only need read access. They only need to see in the device to see how it's performing. Very, very, very true. So, so Anthony, we've uh, this has been a a, a great uh, discussion today. Um, let's let's end up with this. So, if I'm a public agency manager and I'm and I do really want to have a future-proofed data and network strategy, what do I do first, second, third, and fourth? Is there is there a cookbook model that you could um, talk about? For sure. Um, obviously, cities don't have unlimited budgets. And if you look at a lot of the vendors out there, um, the solutions aren't cheap. There are certain things that you can do in-house that will definitely provide more security and better operability of your network. And that's following the NIST NIST framework on cybersecurity, uh, and that's readily available on their website. And it will give you step-by-step -step, um, categories to look over, and you can pick and choose where you want to start. But once you become NIST compliant, I to this day have still not seen a city that has suffered a ransomware attack that was NIST compliant. Um, so th these are things that are provided that you could start doing within your own IT and information security teams to make your network more secure, properly configured. So even if you do suffer intrusion into your network, your network's configured so that no data will escape your network to some unknown site. So you won't lose that data. You might be attacked and realize that penetration happened, uh, but you'll be able to quarantine it and isolate it and prevent data um, from being distributed to unknown sites and so forth. That's where I would definitely start. Um, and sometimes IT teams and information security teams might not have the time or the budget to allow for hours to do this. But I'm telling you, it is much more economical to be able to do it in-house by yourself um, and see how far you can get. If if you hit any bumps in the road or you need some assistance, then yes, reach out to a vendor, reach out to a third party that can assist. Uh, but that would, that would definitely be my number one takeaway. How about guidance on the other pieces of the puzzle? Um, I mean, I know, I think we all know that, uh, you know, there are vendors that will assist you in moving from paper to to an you know online forms, um, as well as the um, storage issue, local storage, remote storage, cloud storage, who owns a server, right. all of those kinds of things. Um, is there some guidance there that's um, a generally accepted best practice? Um, I work with a lot of companies that provide uh, those services. Um, I don't really know of a free best practice for some of these specialties when it comes to uh, multi-cloud configuration and security or um, phishing emails. Uh, so there's software that there's a variety of software that says that they could help prevent spam emails and phishing emails to help prevent uh, ransomware attacks. I would say do your research. There's a lot of options out there, and so, there's new okay. software coming. All right, so so it really is a. Um, I mean, my intuition there said that it's a, it is a fractured market, and you really do need to do your homework because there are uh, a number of you know, good products, some perhaps not so good, and you need to um, some may or may not fit your particular application. 
Right. Um, and there's many facets of it. So you do need, you know, many, you know, many type of anti-phishing software and, you know, many other things. Right. Um, so, um, and, and unfortunately, cities are not, it's not one size fits all. Um, you know, smart city applications are different if you're in the developed world versus perhaps, you know, the developing world as well. Yeah, Jim, and just like yourself, um, you have a lot of experience with a lot of different cities, um, a lot of different DOTs, and uh, a lot of different vendors. People in cities have to do their due diligence. Um, when somebody comes in and presents a product or a software or a solution, see who their competitors are. Uh, see what reviews say, how they stack up against their competitors. Find out the pros and cons, because usually the vendors aren't going to give you what they're not good at or where their shortcomings are. So if you do some uh, quick searches, you could find a little bit of that information. But then if you want some more in-depth information, that's where you could reach out to agnostic subject matter experts uh, sure. that are out there as well. Sure. Okay. Well, well, Anthony, it's been great having you as a guest today on 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 this subject of data and networks. Um, are is there any last comments you'd like to make? Perhaps um, the, for the uh, you know where where's this industry going? What's happening? In the, what do you see happening uh, in the future? Well, one last thing I'll add, and because of the time and uh, the pandemic uh, with uh, the coronavirus, COVID nineteen, a lot of emails will be seen you'll see there's said to see an increase of 30 to 40 percent of phishing emails uh, that may provide solutions or remedies for covid people have to be aware um, of these emails and that there's going to be more phishing attacks and companies and cities aren't going to be on their toes when it comes to cybersecurity with this pandemic going on. Uh, so just keep, try to keep focused uh, with your security. Um, and once this uh, subsides, I think you'll start seeing a lot more uh, as far as the digital transformation gaining more traction because everything we talked about of internet of things and data and uh, data lakes, uh, this can only be done if everything is digital. And then analysis uh, in real time that can happen so that we can map out more precisely where infected people are, where they're traversing, where they've touched. Uh, this information is will be very beneficial the next time something like of this magnitude comes around. Very, very, very true. Very true. Well, Anthony, thank you very much for joining us today. We hope to have you uh, uh, on as a guest again in the relatively near future. Uh, to you, to you and your family, Anthony, be safe out there and make sure you're secure and away from the coronavirus. Um, and, and, and for the same for for all of our listeners, be safe and make sure that uh, you're secure at home and you're practicing social distancing. So again, Anthony, thank you. And we look forward to seeing all of you on a future edition of the Smart Cities podcast. Thank you again. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities.